Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Department of Consumer and Business Services, Division of Financial Regulation, let me welcome you to our third annual hearing on prescription drug prices. My name is Andrew Stolfi. I'm the Oregon State Insurance Commissioner and the Director of the Department of Consumer and Business Services. Uh, the Division of Financial Regulation protects consumers and regulates insurance, state chartered banks and credit unions, securities, uh, and consumer financial products and services. Uh, we also administer the state's prescription drug price transparency program. The division is part of the Department of Consumer and Business Services, which is Oregon's largest consumer protection agency. So we're very excited to host our third annual hearing on prescription drug prices and have a full agenda for the day. So in a moment, program staff will kick off the agenda uh, by sharing a summary of the findings from the program's 2021 legislative report. Uh, but first, I'd like to share a few things. So high and rising prescription drug prices are a major concern at both the national and state levels. The COVID-19 pandemic has given renewed urgency to this topic. The data collected by our program helps expand our understanding of the complex pharmaceutical supply chain so we can better inform policymakers in creating more effective tools to better protect consumers. Before this hearing, we asked Oregonians to send us their questions and stories about prescription drug pricing. We heard from many across the state, including a long-term care provider who relayed this experience with her patients. As a physician who cares for people with multiple sclerosis, every week I meet a patient who cycles on and off disease-modifying therapy due to job loss, excessive co-pays, and other logistical problems, like having to be home to sign for specialty pharmacy drugs. MS has a therapeutic window early in the disease course to prevent or delay disability accumulation. Treatments later in the disease course don't work to slow disability, and there are no effective ways to repair the nervous system. It's not the occasional patient falling through the cracks, but nearly the norm. Healthcare is a patchwork blanket with major holes in it, and drug prices are one of those major holes. Society ends up paying multiple times the cost of medication later due to the cost of being highly disabled. Someone else shared a story about mail order pharmacies saying, my husband has insurance through work. If we order in the mail, we have a $0 copay for a 90 day supply. But if we get it locally, it's a $20 copay for a 30 day supply. Obviously we started going through the mail. Retired pharmacists also shared firsthand experience about drug prices around the world, saying, one example of the highest prices for medications in the world is the US. I was in Athens, Greece several years ago before Voltaren was taken off prescription. In Greece, it cost 595 euros for the same tube that cost over $100 on insurance in the US. Now it is off prescription selling for over $15 over the counter in the US, but in Mexico, the same item is less than $5. We also received lots of questions, such as one Oregonian who asked, why are prices so much higher than other countries? Why are life-changing and life-saving medications often so expensive that people who need them cannot afford them? How can prices be so outrageously high that people must be choose between their medications, a place to live, or even their health? Other people asked questions like, why can't we provide basic prescription drugs for everyone? Or how can we help patients on Medicare, especially to pay for their meds? Or why is it that each pharmacy puts a different price on the same drug? These questions and stories really give life to the issues our program is trying to address. And all of them that we've received are uh, in our annual report and encourage all of you to take a look at them. So turning to our agenda for today, I have the honor of serving as facilitator and I'm thrilled to be joined by five moderators. I can see their name on the screen there. And I'll let each moderator introduce themselves in the order up there and share any opening thoughts they might have. And we'll start with Senator Patterson. 
Good afternoon, Director Stolfi. Thank you so much, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Senator Deb Patterson, and I'm chair of the Senate Health Care Committee. Um, along with Representative Prusak this last session, we were chief sponsors of Senate Bill 844, which will put in place a prescription drug affordability review board to add to the very fine work that this program is doing already, and that we're going to hear more about this afternoon uh, for the uh, third third year in a row, I believe. Um, also, as chief sponsor of Senate Bill 711, which I will examine gender disparities in costs for certain pharmaceuticals. Um, the cost of pharmaceutical drug pricing is a passion for me as it is for others on this panel because of the many communications that with constituents that we receive every week. I'd like to read one I received just a couple of days ago whose personal information I've omitted for privacy. My loved one has type one diabetes, diabe diagnosed at age four and they're now in their thirties. They have an in-body insulin pump and a monitor alarm because their diabetes has always been dangerously unpredictable and erratic. After they graduated from college, they lived with us for a few months before beginning professional training, and I was astonished at how much of their time was focused with managing their diabetes. They were regularly in crisis, sometimes daily. Even with insurance, their out-of-pocket cost for insulin is still hundreds of dollars every month. Thankfully, with the passage of House Bill 2623, which takes effect next month, the cost of insulin for people with health insurance will be limited to $75 for each 30-day 30 30 supply. But there's more work to be done to make other prescription drugs affordable to all Oregonians. And I'm very grateful to the experts at DCBS and elsewhere who are working on these issues. And I look forward to hearing from them all. Thank you so much for inviting us to take part today. Thank you. Great information shared by Senator Patterson. Thank you, Commissioner Stolfi, for inviting us. I am uh, State Representative Rachel Prusak, Chair of House Health Care Committee. I am excited to be here today as a moderator. I have been uh, watching along as an audience member the last two years. Outside of my work as a state representative, I'm a family nurse practitioner. I ran for office because I was tired of seeing my patients ration their medication or not seek care because of costs. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation and having the ability to uh, ask questions of the panel members and continue fighting for access to medications and improved cost. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, Director Stolfi, uh, Representative Rob Nose, thanks for uh, having me be here uh, this afternoon and uh, allowing me to join you and my colleagues uh, in the presentation that we're about to have. Uh, for those in the Zoom audience that uh, may not know, I was uh, the initial sponsor of this bill along with uh, my colleague, uh, Representative Noble, um, back in 2018 uh, to get this program off the ground. Um, I've been able to come to every one of these presentations that DCBS has done uh, since the bill has been going forward, and it's always very interesting, uh, fascinating, enlightening, um, and great to see that um, a piece of legislation that you pass gets implemented and actually begins to do the things that you hope it will. So thank you very much for having me, and um, I'll pass it on to my colleague. Thank you. And Director Stolpe, uh, I also want to thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, my name is Ron Noble. I'm the state representative for House District 24. And um, as was mentioned by my colleague, very proud to have been one of the chief sponsors of this bill to, that brings us here today. Um, you know, drug prices are something that impact all of us. And um, uh, I have a lot of family members who are practitioners, healthcare practitioners. But I also live in a multi-generational household and I see the impacts of prices on pharmaceuticals literally daily on both my, uh, my wife's parents and my parents uh, whom we also provide support to. So I'm very appreciative of the process and look forward to uh, the rest of what we have this afternoon. Thank you, there I think I've got it now. Final member of the panel to introduce myself. Um, I am Trilby D. Young and I'm the Deputy Director of Health Policy and Analytics for the Oregon Health Authority. And I am so excited to be here today to, to share in learnings about this program. 
Um, I think that it's incredibly important to be bringing transparency to all parts of the prescription drug purchasing chain. And I'm so grateful to all the leadership that's been exercised here by the Senator and the representatives in, in bringing this program to bear. Really looking forward to hearing from program staff and most importantly, consumers are, who are here to share their stories and experiences. One quick item to share at the outset, um, over at OHA, of course, access and affordability are always front and center for us as well. And we're at a critical juncture with an initiative that's very related to the hearing that's going on today, and that is the Healthcare Cost Growth Target Program. Um, the Implementation Committee has just finished up two years worth of work, and next month we launch a public hearing for that uh, program to look at data much as the way this program does to really get a handle on trends and to ensure that overall spending does not exceed targets that we've been able to set in that program. So prescription drug spending is a big part of what we'll be hearing about there. And I really am looking forward to exploring how we can bring these two hearings closer together and start to share the learnings um, across these two initiatives. I know there's lots of interest at both OHA and DCBS in doing that in the future. So thanks again for having me here today. I'm really looking forward to the learnings. Thank you very much. And thank you to each of our moderators for joining us today and for being here. So we've got two presentations and two public comment periods for this year's uh, hearing. Uh, first, we're gonna have a presentation from the department followed by our first public comment period. After that, we have invited panels on the topics of the approval of Adjuhelm for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, and another one on patient assistant programs and copay accumulators. After those panels are complete, we'll have our second public comment period before the hearing concludes. And after each presentation, there will be time for questions from the moderators. As I mentioned, we are accepting and encouraging public testimony and comments on prescription drug prices. I encourage you to sign up to speak today uh, in, by typing your name in the comment box down in the Zoom chat. Uh, as I said, there's two opportunities to comment, one in the mid middle and one at the end of the hearing. Please let us know if you have a preference. We do have limited time today, so we'll do our best to get as many people as possible. In the interest of hearing from several people, we may limit time for testimony depending on how many folks sign up. But we also encourage everyone to submit written remarks to the department at rx.prices at dcbs.oregon.gov. And just to note, this public hearing will follow public meeting laws and regulations. And finally, I just want to mention that the Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, Pharma, has filed a complaint in federal court seeking to invalidate the laws that authorize this program. The litigation is ongoing. We have submitted all briefs for a motion for partial summary judgment related to one of the laws, House Bill 4005, and await the court's decision. The portion of the case related to the other state law, House Bill 2658, is stayed pending a decision from a related case in California, uh, which is now pending before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, we can't comment on the ongoing lawsuit, but remain disappointed that they decided to challenge these laws designed to provide transparency, to help Oregonians better understand why drug prices are rising. So that said, let's now hear from our program staff about what we found during this last year. I'm going to turn it over to Sophie first. Thank you, Andrew. Hi, I'm Sophia Para, and I use she, her pronouns. I'm the program coordinator for Oregon's Drug Price Transparency Program. I'll be giving you some information about the program. Then Antonio will provide a demonstration of the information on the transparency website. And Numi will be taking you through highlights of our 2021 annual report to the Oregon Legislature, which will be finalized by December 15th and submitted to the Legislature as well as posted to our website. Next slide, please. The Prescription Drug Price Transparency Act gives the Drug Price Transparency Program statutory authority to require reports from reporting manufacturers. These laws have been clarified with administrative rules. These manufacturers are also required to pay annual fees to cover the costs of program staff. Reporting manufacturers are those who are required to register with the Oregon Board of Pharmacy and then manufacture prescription drugs for humans that are sold in Oregon and then set the drugs 
wholesale acquisition cost. Whack. Not all manufacturers meet this definition, like those who only make non-prescription drugs, um, treatments that aren't part of the definition of prescription drugs, and those who manufacture for a different company. Next slide, please. I wanted to share this. It's a supply chain diagram from the Congressional Budget Office that we include in our annual report. It shows how complex the system is when you're considering all the different programs out there and all of the parties involved on this, depending on the type of coverage. I just wanted to have this up there for a moment to allow our audience to be able to look at it, even though we will have the slides available later as well. Okay, next slide, please. Oops, there we go. There are different reports that we receive, which is the information that we use to um, gathering. There are three reports from reporting manufacturers. There are reports for new drugs that are $670 or more per month. There are annual price increase reports for uh, increases that are 10% or more when comparing the years. And then there is also reports for notices about planned price increases, which must be 60 days before the planned increase. We also receive two types of reports from insurers. That is through the annual rate review process. We get the top 25 in a various categories, and then of course the impact on premiums. Numi will cover highlights from what we received for this year's annual report to the legislature. Next slide, please. And then finally, one of the really important parts of our program is to get consumer reporting. We really need to get consumers to tell us and share information about price increases that they experience. We have a form on our website and we plan to do more outreach. We encourage consumers to send stories and questions. We have a survey available for that where we collect information, which we will also include in our report. We urge any consumers who have a price increase to please come to our website and report that information to us. That will really assist us in the, in the future. And then we will continue to do more outreach. We will try to get this information out there to make sure that consumers know what's available and how to use our website and can come to our website. All right. Next is Antonio is up to present in some information. Hi, I'm Antonio Vargas. I use he, him pronouns, and I'll be giving a very quick introduction to a new feature of the program's website where the reports submitted by pharmaceutical manufacturers can be viewed directly. This is a major milestone of the program, and it's the culmination of a huge amount of work from the department's IT team and the transparency program team. The app can be accessed from the transparency program's data page by clicking the button that says, view the reports submitted by manufacturers. In the app, the drugs, manufacturers, and consumer notifications buttons at the top bring you to different tabs. The Drugs tab, where we start with every drug we've received a report for. Clicking on a drug reveals a list of the individual reports we've received for that drug, and clicking on a report lets you view the information inside it. Above the drug list, there are several filters you can use to help you browse or search for specific drugs. The most important here is probably the one in the top middle, which lets you switch between different types of reports the program receives. You can select new specialty drug to view the new high cost drug reports, annual increase to view the annual price increase reports, price increase to view the 60 day notice price increase reports, and consumer notification to see the reports we receive from consumers. Another useful filter is the statuses filter, which lets you see filings at different levels of departmental review. Filings with status filing complete have gone through a full review and have the most information displayed. Next, we'll look at the Manufacturers tab. This tab lists all the manufacturers that have submitted reports to the program. 
If you click a manufacturer's name, you can view all of their reports. Let's take a look at this report for Skyreasy submitted by Abdi. Inside the report, you can see what the manufacturer entered for each data element. If the manufacturer marked a data element as trade secret, so for example, this manufacturer marked their marketing description as trade secret, you can see the original or redacted data depending on the department's determination to disclose or not disclose it. The department's explanation for its decision to disclose the data in this case can be seen by clicking the explanation button. And at the bottom of the filing, the full record of correspondence between the department and the manufacturer relating to this report is available to read. We encourage the public to read through the filings that the department has completed the review of. These are the ones that show when you set the status filter on the main page to filing complete. And with that, I'll turn it over to Numi Griffith to continue the presentation from the Transparency Program team. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nimi Lee Griffith. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a senior policy advisor with the Division of Financial Regulation. Uh, and uh, for a while, I was in Sophie's job as the program coordinator for the Drug Price Transparency Program. So uh, what I'm going to do today is take you through a few highlights of our 2021 report, which will be released uh, sometime by before, on or before December 15th, which is our uh, deadline for doing that each year. And uh, this reflects data that we collected between the last report, which was the, uh, let's see, which was for uh, data through the end of October of 2020. Uh, this report is based on, uh, the upcoming report will be based on data which was collected from that point up until October of this year. Uh, so I'm just going to do a kind of quick general overview of some of the information that we have collected for this year, uh, which is just kind of going over first uh, some of the broad strokes and then some specifics about the various report types. Uh, for new high cost drug reports, so again, this is uh, drugs with a uh, whack price for a 30 day supply of $670 or more. We received reports for 193 new drugs. 121 were generic, uh, 72 were brand for brand name drugs. The uh, two highest price reports that we saw this year were for uh, Abecma and Brianzi, which are both CAR T cancer therapies produced by Bristol Myers Squibb, uh, both at around $410,000. Uh, so, one thing, a couple things I'll note about that. Uh, CAR T is a relatively new therapy. Uh, it is basically genetic therapy and actually um, ha has been the highest prices that we've seen over the last three years have all been for CAR T. So that is uh, Golgensma back in 2019 um, for, uh, and I'm forgetting the name of the cancer drug from last year, but it was also CAR T and then we have these two CAR T cancer therapies this year as the two highest cost drugs reported to us. For price increase reports, we received uh, reports for 71 drug families, uh, 40 generic, 31 branded. The largest single increase that was reported this year was a net increase of 778% for a generic produced by Nostrum Laboratories, but that's an extreme example uh, for the sort of more typical reports. Uh, we do calculate averages, so the average increase for generics that reported was around 27%. The average increase for brands that reported was around 13%. Uh, and last thing I'll mention kind of in this broad overview is uh, insurance reporting. We collect reports from 10 insurers. And so that is uh, the insurers that participate in a small group and the uh, individual marketplaces, which are required to go through rate review with the department, which is, uh, Currently, our insurer reports are tied to that. Uh, so we have 10 insurers, some uh, reported only on those two marketplace segments, which are required, and some also provide information for other marketplace segments that they, uh, that they serve, such as Medicaid. And uh, 
we're really hoping to continue getting insurers to report broadly, uh, report across market segments so we have as full a picture of the data as we possibly can. Um, highlights from that, uh, the most expensive drug for Oregonians for the third year in a row was Humira, uh, which insurers paid out $93 million for 19,000 prescriptions across our reporting insurers. And also note that Humira did have a 7.4% net price increase over the last year, which uh, ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review, has estimated led to $1.4 billion in additional spending nationally just from that price increase. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a breakdown of uh, the types of, uh, of the various classes of drug that we received new drug reports for. And as you can see, the most commonly reported new drug is that pop, pop bar, antineoplastics and adjunctive therapies. That basically means cancer drugs. Um, this is continuing the trend that most of the highest cost drugs that we see tend to be for cancer uh, or for other sort of difficult to treat disease states that don't have a lot of treatments out, out there for them already. And they also tend to be biologics. Uh, so like RT, which is a genetic therapy, or things like monoclonal antibodies, such as uh, aducanumab, which we have a panel focused on the treatment for Alzheimer's, which, uh, so the big difference there, biologics are, um, biologics are what we would call large molecule drugs, which are actually produced inside of living cells, as opposed to the sort of more conventional small molecule drugs, which are created using chemical processes in a laboratory, basically. Uh, so most of the really high cost therapies that we see coming in are biologics and they're one of the biggest drivers of costs in the prescription drug space. Uh, next slide, please. So this is showing some information from our price increase reports. Uh, when one of the elements that we collect is uh, the direct costs that manufacturers uh, went through in the previous year for the drugs that they're reporting on. Um, and so we collect information on direct costs related to four different categories, marketing, distribution, safety and effectiveness, research, and manufacturing. Uh, and so this slide shows a comparison of how those costs are broken down in these reports between brand name drugs on the left and generic drugs on the right. So the sort of big thing that stands out there is that for generic drugs, almost the entire pie there is occupied by the manufacturing costs. And uh, of course, not basically nothing is related to uh, safety and effectiveness research since generics generally are producing compounds that were researched and developed by another company and then they're bringing these competing products into market. So um, other thing that I'll point out, of course, that for brand name drugs, about 20% of direct costs reported on average was going to marketing. Um, so that is a pretty sizable chunk of the pie. And anybody who's seen, uh, who, who, who's watched TV probably has seen drug ads. So that's part of where that's coming from. Uh, next slide, please. So this is kind of, this slide is going over a long-term trend that we've noticed. And that is that we have seen fewer price increase reports each year that the program has operated. That was from a following a quite drastic drop the first year from when we received around 550 reports to the following year when it dropped to around 150. And then this year we saw a smaller decrease. So that is the chart on the left, which is showing uh, the number of reports that we received each year broken down by brand and generic. As you can see in the first year, the vast majority of price increase reports were branded. And then since then, it's been about an even split, as well as being a much smaller number overall. Uh, so this actually corresponds to a much wider market trend, which you can see on the right side of this slide. So this is data which was put together by a consulting firm or a research firm called 46 Brooklyn is using data from Medicaid primarily, but also have some access to some uh, drug price databases and of tracking price increases over time. And what we've seen in their data, as well as in our data, is that there has been a drop in the number of price increases. So that's what this uh, graph shows on the right, as well as the a drop in the magnitude of price increases. So two things, 
that we have seen fewer price increases numerically, and we've also seen fewer price increases in terms of percentage. So uh, 2021 so far has been on track to kind of pick up slightly uh, from where we've been the past couple of years, but I mean, it's really too soon to say anything about that. So we've talked about this uh, trend, the decrease in price increase reports, pretty much every time I presented to the legislature over the last year. And uh, we've speculated a lot about what are the different things that could be driving this. So this is because uh, we have transparency laws now in not only in Oregon, but in around 15 other states, I believe, have passed transparency laws since we did, uh, that there's putting pressure on the drug price, to, on the drug manufacturers to no longer increase prices. Or is there something else going on with market behavior of prescription drug companies? Uh, so uh, next slide, please. Um, I've tried to put together some comparison here to kind of get an eye at what's going on. So what this graph is, the bars are basically the same graph that I showed you on the last slide, which is the number of price increases that we've seen. And then overlaying that is the average launch price of new drugs, which is mapped to the left axis. So number of whack increases is mapped on the right axis. For average launch prices on the left side. So that point in time where we saw the sort of in the overall trend, the drop in the number of price increases and also the drop in the magnitude of price increases was around 2015 going into 2016, 2017. And what you can see there is that at the exact same time that we saw that decrease in price increases and that decrease in the magnitude of price increases was a huge, huge jump in the average launch price of new drugs which prior to that had been kind of averaging around the $2,500 mark uh, throughout most of the 2010s. It was around the $1,000 mark throughout the uh, early 2000s. And then in 2016, going into 2017, it jumped up to $10,000 was the average start of launch price of a new drug. Um, I've excluded 2019 from this data set, which is uh, the last year that I had this data available for. Uh, because of Zilgensma. So the average launch price of new drugs in 2019 is actually $275,000, but that's only because Zilgensma costs $2.1 million for a dose, basically. So the, hopefully I'll be able to show longer term data on this, see if this is a trend that we're continuing to see, but we're not quite there yet. What this really suggests is a change in behavior from manufacturers that rather than increasing prices throughout lifespan of a drug, they're building all of that, uh, all of their profit goals into the beginning of the life cycle, that they're price pricing the drug higher initially, and then basically having it so that, and having fewer price increases and smaller price increases throughout the life of the drug, which allows them to not send in reports to programs like ours, where we have set the thresholds for reporting based on the magnitude of price increases. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, and this is just kind of a general slide showing uh, overall prescription drug spending spending across the US. We've seen fewer price increases, but drug price but drug spending has continued to increase as I was just talking about. So there's still a lot of work to be done. And uh, we have, of course, recommendations in the report. There's a lot of other data in the report that I'd encourage you to look once we look for, once we get it released, that will be by December 15th. And, uh, We'll be happy to answer any questions, go over any of the data that we uh, that we pass by, and uh, thanks all much for your attention. Yumi, Antonio, Sophie, thank you so much for all that great information. We we've got time for a question or two from our moderators, if if they have any. So please, moderators. Yeah, Senator Patterson. Thank you so much, Director Stolfi, and thank you to all the uh, presenters. I have a question for uh, Numi. Uh, Numi, if I am understanding correctly, it looks like a strategy may be to just start the price at a very, uh, introduce the drug at a very high price, um, and then raise the cost very little, not triggering anything related to drug um, increases, cost increases. Am I correct in, in reading your data? Yes, that is uh, what I was trying to show is that there is actually a correlation in time. I think you can't absolutely say that's what's going on, but it certainly uh, is consistent with what we've observed. One other thing that I'll note is that uh, the uh, way that 
drugs are priced and, uh, uh, and paid for in Medicaid, so that would be the Oregon Health Plan, because of the Oregon prescription or the, uh, the Medicaid drug rebate program actually uh, is set up in a way so that it uh, restricts, uh, so, so Medicaid for drugs, when a drug is purchased through Medicaid, the, uh, the manufacturer is required to give an automatic rebate that basically locks the price to the rate of inflation. And because of that, uh, that actually creates a potential incentive for drug manufacturers to do this in addition to the sort of avoiding the scrutiny attached to drug price increases. It was because Medicaid, as a condition of participation in the rebate program, they will have to accept all FDA approved drugs for coverage. That kind of gives an incentive for drug companies to just price real high and avoid those price increases because they won't be able to reap profits through Medicaid for price increases because of the rebate program. So Thank yes, you. you are correct in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Any other moderators with a question? I see Representative Noble. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, yeah, my question actually is a, a follow-up comment to what the Senator brought in. Uh, in looking at the data, uh, Numi, it appears that the initial cost of the drug started going up two and a half years before the passing of uh, House Bill 4005 and transparency. Um, and, and then you mentioned 2019 was a little bit skewed because of the price there. Um, so I'm I'm just a little bit skeptical. Do you, do you have a reason for the increase in prices prior to the passage of the transparency bill as opposed to as the cause of the uh, caused by the transparency bill? Uh, well, I think there's a couple things. Um, obviously, we had transparency started in Oregon in 2019, uh, passage of the bill in 2018. California had a similar timeline. They passed the bill in 2018 and started taking effect. Uh, so um, you can't say that those sort of big price, that big change in behavior was just connected to transparency. It's also Medicaid drug replay program, as I mentioned, kind of the spectral incentive initial high price plus like fewer, uh, fewer price increases through the life of the drug. The other thing is that we had, uh, that uh, a transparency wasn't the beginning of controversy around drug pricing. It's we had this bill passed because there had been frustration publicly and with uh, within the legislature, of course, with what was going on. So there was a lot of scrutiny. There was a lot of news reporting going on around drug price increases uh, and so, the pressure was somewhat on in that space to not have big price increases even before the laws were passed. So that's what I would offer as an explanation. I wouldn't want to speculate too much because it's hard to line anything up, but you are right that that sort of big jump in price increases happened a year before we even started operating. And so you can't say the transparency was the cause of that particular change in behavior. Okay, yeah, because I it, it sounded like that might have been the correlation, at least I, I, I heard. I, I, uh, I, the reason I ask is because I my biggest issue a lot of times is with unintended consequences with legislation. And um, if we were able to actually have a direct correlation that would be different um, as opposed to other anecdotal information from other states and, and the industry as, as a whole. Um, but I look forward to as we continue on through the years and taking a look at some, some good data. Uh, so I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Rep Noble. Uh, Trilby has a question and then Rep Prusak and then we'll move on. Thank you. I'm having trouble with my buttons here. Um, Numi, just one more question about this data. This is such an interesting, um, possibility that your data highlights about just starting the drug prices at such a higher level. And I'm wondering if that's also borne out uh, nationally. Um, I know the dynamics and the timing of the different programs may be a little different in different states, but I'm thinking this is most likely a national trend. Uh, yes. So the data that I was using that demonstration uh, doesn't come from our own data in part because that was something that I was trying to highlight some of the limitations that we're reporting since we're I do these price increases uh, as the data that we collect. We don't see anything that's below 10% price increase year over year in our own data. So we have a uh, database called Metaspan that we use, but also like looking to other 
groups of research like 46 Brooklyn, which is the source that I drew those charts from, right, um, right. is a place that is using national data and is not limited in scope by their sort of reporting requirements the way that ours is. So mm -hmm. that is where that came from. That is reflective of natural national trends. And of course, uh, WAC prices are the same across the country. So uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that is reflective of that. OK, thank you. <laughs> Representative Prusak. Thank you, Commissioner. Given the time crunch, I'm just going to make a quick comment. During this first 15 minutes or so of this, I've already received a message from a patient's family member concerned because uh, Victoza costing $3,300 and will be a $600 copay. So thank you for all the work that you're doing on this and look forward to the continued work. Thank you, Representative. Thank you so much, Representative. And thank you again to Sophie, Antonio, and Numi for all that great information. Uh, reminder, a lot of that will be in the report that we're publishing very soon as well. And as Antonio pointed out, on our website on that new app. So now we're gonna to move to our first public comment period. We do have two people signed up uh, for this one and, and one other individual, uh, two more uh, that we'll have at the end uh, as well. So first we're gonna to go to AARP State Director, uh, Bundana Shrishta. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, I'm not sure if uh, I can, I, I'm having some trouble with my internet here, but I'm hoping I'm visible. Good afternoon. I'm uh, Bandanesh Rashtra, State Director for ARP Oregon here, and uh, I'm pleased to provide testimony on behalf of our members on prescription drug prices today. I was really struck by the, um, the report that Numi just shared, and I'm um, very intrigued uh, to dive into this trend that you outlined. Um, just goes to show, though, even though there may be some decreases in prices, I think at the end of the day, what we're thinking about is how does it impact uh, mm -hmm. consumers? And what um, Representative Prusak just said really, um, really underlines what I'm hoping to highlight uh, here. So ARP, for those of you who don't know, is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to empowering Americans 50 plus um, to choose how they live as they age. And we have over 500,000 members here in Oregon, our members. And uh, I would say all Oregonians are really sick and tired of paying highest drug prices in the world for critically needed medication. Um, we pay three times what other countries pay for brand name drugs. And, uh, you know, the prices are going up um, at the beginning of 2021. More than 100 pharmaceutical companies raised drug prices um, for 600 drugs. And this is not just a one-time uh, problem. Uh, Oregonians should, really should not have to choose between buying medication and paying for food and rent. Sadly, that's really a reality for so many. And um, here in Oregon, the annual cost of prescription drug treatment uh, increased over 26% between 2015 and 2019, whereas income only raised by went up by about 14%. And, uh, you know, I could, I would give like to give you an example of one particular uh, drug. Uh, in 2018, there were 393,000 Oregonians that were diagnosed with cancer and Revlimid is a cancer drug that may be really helpful for a lot of folks. Between 2015 and 2020, the price of this drug went from 187,000 to 267,000 per year. And this year, the price has gone up to about uh, 280. I, I mean, I can't imagine who would be able to pay for that. A ARP is advocating at the federal level on lowering the cost of prescription drugs, uh, including giving Medicare the authority to negotiate drug prices. And, you know, that's going to help but there's so much more that can be done at the state level. Here in Oregon, we're so pleased that we've made some advances, real advances in bringing transparency, but there's more to do to really enact meaningful reforms that'll help uh, and make differences for uh, Oregonians. Um, the newly enacted Prescription Drug Affordability Board has an important role to play. We believe that uh, that board should be empowered um, to set upper payment limits on certain high price drugs, utilizing data that's already collected by the existing drug price transparency law. Um, and while we believe this should be applied to all payers in the state, even if it's just applied to government payers, it would uh, reduce uh, drug spending. 
uh, by the government considerably. There's a, in our my te written testimony, there's an example from Oklahoma uh, about how this would uh, work out. But at the end of the day, ARP believes that Oregon should use international reference uh, pricing using Canadian prices as reference point to establish upper payment limits on drugs that the prescription afford, um, our PDAB determines are overpriced. This would really um, effectively reduce spending if it's applied to all peers. Um, you know, it would not only be the out-of-pocket costs, but also uh, possibly lower health premiums uh, for all Oregonians. We also support expanding bulk purchasing efforts, banning pay for delay, and also uh, so we support preventing insurance companies from changing their formularies in the middle of the plan year. This can be really disruptive and you know changes uh, how people might have budgeted for out of cost uh, pocket costs for a medication um, there's so much to be done and these things are so complicated but at the end of the day our concern is how is drug, this increase in drug prices impacting everyday oregonians um, we stand ready to work with others in addressing the high cost of prescription drugs so that our members and other uh, Oregonians 50 plus and their families don't have to make those very tough decisions they're having to make right now between food, rent, and the drugs they need to live. Thank you so much for your attention and uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. Very much appreciate it. Uh, so we, we have a couple people signed up. We're gonna, uh, and one of those individuals, Bill Robbie, uh, has a conflict later. So Bill from the National Hemophilia Foundation We'll allow you to go now and uh, come back to our other commenters later in the agenda. So Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I appreciate it very much. I've submitted a written statement and I just wanted to make a couple of comments on a, a, a future issue and that's the co-payment accumulator. Adjuster programs, you've got a panel on later. Uh, it's early release Wednesday, so I've got to go pick up my son later and then I've got a doctor's appointment, so I'll be in my car. I just want to say really quickly, we appreciate your attention to drug prices. This is an important issue for us. Um, we understand payers need to control cost. Our concern with the copayment accumulator adjuster programs is it really punishes those people with chronic diseases, uh, high, expensive diseases like hemophilia. For those of you who don't know, we are one of the more high cost conditions, um, whether it's Medicaid or in commercial insurance. Um, of, of any condition. And so we have the majority of our folks are on high deductible health plans. That is who really gets hurt by the copay accumulator programs. For the most part, we've seen most of our problems with ERISA regulated self-insured plans, not so much at the state level. However, we know that, that many, if not most marketplace plans have copay accumulator adjuster language buried in the contract that may or may not be used with patients. So um, we understand state activities will not affect ERISA regulated plans, but we're also working on this on a federal level. So again, we these um, copay accumulator programs are really punitive towards high cost patients like, uh, like our folks who really have no other choice. They have a chronic disease that has no, can't be prevented and there is no cure. It's a lifetime regimen of high cost therapies uh, and they have to go with it. They can't go without their medication. Otherwise, they're going to be in the emergency department. So I just want to make that comment. We are very much opposed to it. And I should say, first of all, I'm uh, the state government relations team for the National Hemophilia Foundation. I work out of my home in Bend um, and I'm happy to participate and appreciate uh, the state's attention to this issue. Uh, our chapter here in Oregon, Pacific Northwest Bleeding Disorders, and I have worked closely with state legislators in this issue, including in the past legislative session <clears throat> on Senate Bill 560. Um, and thank you again for allowing me to jump in here and take this opportunity. Thank you, Bill. And definitely look forward to the conversation later around this topic specifically. So with that, we'll, we'll end our first public comment period and let's move on to our first panel. And for this panel, we're excited to discuss the approval of Adjuhelm for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. So we chose this topic because the approval and pricing of Adjuhelm has been much discussed lately, and it highlights many of the critical issues policymakers must consider related to prescription drug pricing. 
Uh, to be clear, the department does not take any position on the approval or pricing of drugs, but we do recognize the importance of this topic. As for the drug itself, Adrihalum is the first treatment in 18 years to be approved by the FDA for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. It's also the first treatment intended to target the disease process itself rather than treating symptoms. The drug has a high list price of $56,000 per year and has been surrounded by controversy. With the FDA's approval in June 2021, there's been much discussion on what this means for both patients and insurers, especially public funded insurance like Medicare and Medicaid, which is why we included it in our discussion today. We invited many different perspectives to join us today and are glad to have two presenters who are very familiar with Audrey Helm join us to share their views and answer some questions. So let's allow those two presenters to speak and then we'll have an opportunity for moderators to ask some questions. We're going to start with Grace Lynn, who's a medical director of health technology assessment, ICER, and associate professor of medicine and health policy, at the University of California, San Francisco. Grace, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you for providing me the opportunity to present at the Oregon Drug Tra Price Transparency Hearings. Um, as Director Stolfi said, my name is Grace Lynn. I'm a primary care physician and a health services researcher at the University of California, San Francisco. And I'm also the medical director for health technology assessment at ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. For those of you who are not familiar with ICER, ICER is an independent nonprofit that develops publicly available value assessments of new therapies and treatments. Specifically, um, we do clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness analyses um, that are used to determine value-based price benchmarks. Um, these um, analyses are then reviewed by independent appraisal committees. Um, next slide, please. Um, and next slide. Last September, um, ICER began a 10-month public process of reviewing aducanumab. Next slide, please. Um, as part of the process, we engage stakeholders, including patients, families, patient groups, clinicians, and manufacturers. We engaged with the manufacturer um, and had multiple contacts and discussions with them over a period of the review. Um, in consultation with outside experts, we then carefully review the information on aducanumab, including the data from the phase 1b trial and the randomized trials that engage and emerge. We also reviewed the explanations and analyses put forth by the manufacturer to explain why the engaged trial had not found a benefit. Next slide, please. What we found was that aducanumab clearly reduces beta amyloid in a dose-dependent fashion. Um, both engage and emerge. Um, in both trials, patients treated with high-dose aducanumab had greater reductions in amyloid than those treated with low-dose aducanumab and those treated with placebo. However, in terms of clinical benefit, while eMERGE showed a small but statistically significant slowing of cognitive decline, ENGAGE did not. Um, and these were identically um, designed contemporaneous trials. Prior trials have failed to demonstrate that reducing brain amyloid in patients with Alzheimer's disease improves clinical outcomes. And as such, um, rather than trying to discover why ENGAGE was negative, the question really should have been asked, was why the trials came to conflicting results. Um, the manufacturer conducted some post hoc analyses to try to understand the differing results. Um, since post hoc analyses break randomization, uh, results are best thought of as hypothesis generating rather than conclusive. I specifically examined the dose exposure explanation that was put forth by the manufacturer in, in their post hoc analyses, and we concluded that this explanation was unlikely to be correct. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that we found was that, um, as demonstrated in these graphs um, that plot the primary outcome, which is a CDR sum of boxes, um, plotted on these graphs of um, uh, based on APO lipoprotein E status and dose of um, drug. And the, uh, you can see on the left side, um, the engaged trial and on the right side, the eMERGE trial. And on the scale on the, um, uh, for the scale of CDRSB, higher is actually worse and lower is actually better. 
Um, so you can see here on the left for engage, um, if you look at both the APOE negative and the APOE positive groups, um, the uh, pattern is what you would expect if uh, uh, exposure to the drug is in fact um, correlated with clinical benefit where uh, the high dose group in the red does better than the low dose group in the green does better than placebo. Um, however, if you look at eMERGE on the right side of the slide, in both the APOE negative and APOE positive groups, you find that there's no similar connection between the received dose and outcomes. In other words, the, the pattern is not um, consistent with um, a dose uh, exposure um, response. Thus, it seems more likely that the post hoc analyses of engage is simply um, that the, this analysis happened to find a positive result um, by the combination of chance and multiple testing rather than being a true um, positive result. We don't know um, why eMERGE and engage had different results. But even in eMERGE, which is the positive trial, the results at 26 and 50 weeks show numerically larger improvements in CDRSB with low dose treatment than with high dose treatment. Um, the results at week 78 with high dose treatment may be due to chance, and there were two opportunities for that positive result, one before the trial was stopped for futility, and another when additional data were gathered and eMERGE was reanalyzed. Next slide, please. Um, other concerns. Um, that were brought up were that the um, experts suggested the small difference in eMERGE was not clinically important, that you could not see um, benefit, you would not see benefit um, that small in patients, um, that there were safety um, issues in terms of um, brain swelling, including um, uh, amyloid related um, uh, brain swelling or aria. Um, and additionally, there was a lack of diversity um, and a relatively younger age um, of the clinical trial population, which could limit generalizability of, its res of these results. Next slide, please. In terms of the cost effectiveness analysis, um, the ICER model found that aducanumab treatment effectiveness was the most influential input in terms of affecting the cost per quality adjusted light year met metric. Um, thus, since any clinical benefit, if, if present, was not large, ICER estimated that a discount of between 80 to 97 percent of the current $56,000 price would be needed to achieve the typical um, $100,000 cost effectiveness threshold. In summary, um, ICER's review of aducanumab found that the evidence is inconclusive. Um, for benefit over standard care. Um, and this was reiterated by an independent panel, this California um, Technology Assessment Forum that voted 15 to zero that the evidence is not um, adequate to conclude that aducanumab provides net health benefit compared with supportive care alone. Um, and an additional rigorous randomized controlled trial is needed to establish benefit. Um, again, aducanumab was not cost effective as tr at traditional thresholds, basically um, due to the fact that the clinical benefit, if any, was very small. Um, a full report of, and the public meeting recording can be found uh, at the ICER's website. Um, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much for that. And please hold on. We'll, we'll come back to some questions after we hear from our next panelists. Very glad to turn it over to Aaron Kesselhelm, Professor of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Aaron, the floor is now yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Andrew, and thank you for inviting me to join you today. Uh, my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm an internal medicine physician and a lawyer and a health uh, policy researcher at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And um, I was uh, intimately involved with the aducanumab or adihelm story because I was a member of the FDA Peripheral and Central Nervous System Advisory Committee that reviewed aducanumab back in November of 2020. And um, we as a committee voted unanimously against uh, the uh, uh, approval of the drug and then the FDA uh, approved it anyway, despite our negative vote. Um, and so this summer I resigned from the committee uh, to bring attention to um, that, uh, what I thought was a bad decision. And uh, I called this decision, uh, the worst drug approval decision in recent FDA history um, and I think that the reason that is, is because of two things. First of all, um, it's a very problematic drug. Uh, and second of all, because the decision is a very problematic uh, decision. So the, the, the reasons why the drug is problematic were 
described in um, a very uh, uh, exquisite detail uh, by Dr. Lin. Um, but just to review, basically, this is a, a drug that's in, uh, you know, intended to try to treat uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease who have a uh, protein deposit. Uh, many patients with Alzheimer's disease have a protein deposit in their brain called amyloid plaque. And there's a a thought that this amyloid plaque might be related to the cognitive decline in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And so for 20 years, um, researchers have been developing drugs um, that you know, try to reduce amyloid plaque by disaggregating it or inhibiting its production. And none of those drugs have worked. Um, aducanumab is a very effective monoclonal antibody that reduces the amount of amyloid plaque in the brain. And um, the, the manufacturer, uh, to its credit, organized two trials to try to understand whether or not that effect actually translated to improvement in, in cognitive function in patients with mild Alzheimer's disease. When those trials were reviewed by the Data Safety Monitoring Board uh, about halfway through the trial, the Data Safety Monitoring Board ruled that the trials were futile and it didn't look like the drug had any effect. In the months after that, uh, as the final data rolled in, um, the manufacturer pulled the two trials apart and evaluated them separately and found that in the high dose group of one of the two trials, it looked like patients may have uh, uh, worsened slightly less um, than, uh, than the uh, placebo group. Now, a um, couple things about that. First of all, in the other trial, which was an identically designed trial, um, the, 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 actually the placebo group did worse, um, even though it wasn't statistically significant. And in addition to that, the amount of change in, in patients after 18 months of therapy um, was less uh, than one might expect to observe clinically. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so it's unclear whether or not the very slight statistically significant change observed in one of the trials was, was meaningful clinically at all. At the same time, what people did notice was then over a third of patients experienced brain swelling and brain bleeding, um, most of which was, um, was, uh, you know, was able to be managed in the context of the clinical trial. But as you know, patients who are enrolled in clinical trials are observed much more closely um, and have many more um, you know, routine MRIs and, and hospital visits and, and doctor visits than patients who are given a drug in, in um, in normal course of therapy and in, uh, in, in clinical care. Um, anyway, as, a, uh, as an advisory committee, we were asked to review these data and we ruled, we, we, we uh, said you know, nearly unanimously that we did not think that there was convincing evidence that this drug worked. Um, and uh, during that meeting, the FDA said, look, we're not considering the effect on amyloid plaque. We want you to evaluate the effect on patients. Um, and so that's what we did. Uh, and then six months later, when the FDA approved the drug, um, the FDA actually approved the drug on the basis of its effect on amyloid plaque through a pathway called the accelerated approval pathway that's intended for uh, drugs that affect um, surrogate measures or biomarkers like amyloid plaque. But in this case, even though this drug does have a, a good effect on this, on this biomarker, there's all of this data out there that the drug does not seem to have any clear effect on, on patients. Um, and so the FDA kind of went back on its word uh, at, this, at this hearing and approved the drug on the basis of this, um, of this surrogate measure anyway. And initially, by the way, the FDA approved the drug for all patients with Alzheimer's disease, although after some outcry, it went back and it narrowed the indication to patients with um, early stage Alzheimer's disease. So this is, there is no convincing evidence that this drug um, has a real uh, substantial effect um, or, or has any effect on, on patients with Alzheimer's disease. And there is, but there is at the same time, very clear evidence that the drug um, has important safety issues that will affect patients. And now that's, this is where we get to the, to the not, not only is it a bad drug, but it's a bad process because again, the FDA approved the drug through this um, accelerated approval pathway. The, the manufacturer agreed to do a follow-up study. Um, the FDA gave the manufacturer nine years to complete that study. Um, and then the, the manufacturer set the price of the drug at $56,000 a year, um, which means that if, if even a moderate number of patients on Medicare with Alzheimer's disease take this drug, we could end up spending more on this drug alone than we spend the, for the entire budget of NASA. 
And so, you know, there is really no reason why this drug should be on the market. It should be on, you know, under continued testing to try to understand, does it really have an effect? Does it not have an effect? Um, and, you know, what can we do about these side effects that the, that the drug is associated with? Um, but nonetheless, the drug remains on the market. And, um, you know, in the meantime, uh, Medicare is undergoing a review to determine whether or not they're going to cover the drug. Um, although, you know, historically, Medicare covers every drug that, that is FDA approved. And of course, Medicaid doesn't really have a choice uh, and has to cover uh, basically all FDA approved drugs. So I guess what I would recommend uh, to Oregon is, is twofold. First of all, um, I think that Oregon needs to develop a, a prescription drug affordability board um, that will review um, high cost drugs like aducanumab that have, um, you know, no uh, convincing evidence that they work. Um, to be able to set um, or, you know, to, to sort of, you know, set policy about, uh, you know, coverage for this product. Uh, and then I think the other thing that Oregon needs to do is invest in academic detailing to educate physicians um, about, uh, about drugs like this um, that don't offer uh, benefits to their, uh, to patients, but offer substantial risks, because there's a lot of miscommunication and misinformation right now going on about this drug where people think, that this is a great new treatment for Alzheimer's disease when it really isn't. And, uh, and so, you know, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I look forward to, to your questions in the, in the discussion. Thank you so much, doctors. This is a, a very interesting, might sound complex issue. It's very fascinating. There's a lot of material out there. Folks can read to, to learn more about this, including we have a whole uh, section in our upcoming report on this drug and, as well. So let's see if we've got any questions from our moderators uh, for these two panelists. You know, I, I don't have a question, um, but I just wanted to say thank you to uh, the department and to the presenter for sharing this. Um, it was fascinating actually uh, to listen to the two of you sort of explain this and sort of reveal both some of the scientific machinations, but also, frankly, some of the political machinations. I hope that I hope that Medicaid really takes a strong look at this because um, I can't imagine um, something costing as much as it does for us to fund NASA that doesn't seem to have the efficacy that it ought to have. Thank you, Rep. Notice to see Representative Prusak has a question or hand up. Thank you, Commissioner. I do, but it was for the representative for the medication. Are they here? Oh, I can't hear you. Uh, sorry, they were, they were unable to join us today, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll make a comment. Um, thank you to, I think it was Dr. Lynn. I don't have, I can't see everyone right now. And thank you to um, the last speaker, um, Aaron, for your bravery, for speaking up, speaking out, quitting. Um, I am a family nurse practitioner and, and chair of the healthcare committee. And um, I currently specialize in um, working for uh, seeing patients that are homebound. So 80% of my patients are those with dementia. And I will say that the burden of dementia for caregivers and patients is so great. And so I really understand the enthusiasm for any hope. And with that being said, it is criminal for us to spend this amount of money for someone to profit that doesn't actually have benefits. And so thank you both. And had he been here, what I really wanted to know, and maybe we can all look at is, what other medications have gone through that type of rapid process? And they must have had, uh, uh, and maybe you two know this, um, a, a much better uh, voting record for support for it from the board to the FDA. Or are there other medications that may have gotten this approval at this cost with the um, unanimous um, vote to not approve? That would be helpful to understand other meds that have this similar fast track without approval. Um, and thank you again for your bravery. 
well, thank you very much for your for your question, Representative Prusak, and for your, of course for your work with patients with dementia. And, and I, you know, I have care for patients with dementia myself. I have family members who have had dementia, and it is a, a terrible disease and one that that has a lot of you know a lot of burden and, uh, for family members in in your Oregon and in, and in the country. And um, you know, I think we all uh, really want something for these patients, and unfortunately. Um, this is not the drug, and by spending a lot of money on this uh, on this product that where there's no good evidence that it works, we are you know taking money away from uh, from you know avenues and, and trying and and uh, the, the avenues that that might actually help patients, uh, and and I think that that's a, I think that's a pity. Um, in terms of your specific question about advisory committees, this is the the only the only case that I know of where there was a, a unanimous advisory committee vote. Uh, against the drug and the FDA uh, decided to approve the drug anyway. Um, uh, the FDA follows its advisory committee votes about 75% of the time, um, but usually when the FDA disagrees, it's actually in the, in the direction of being more conservative, where the, FD, the advisory committee suggests something is approvable and the FDA decides against it. It is relatively rare that it happens where the, the an advisory committee votes uh, against the drug and the FDA approves it anyway. And it is, as I said, to my knowledge, unheard of that it is done in a, in a unanimous way uh, and the FDA approves it anyway. So I, I think there are a lot of um, unprecedented actions taken in the context of this drug that uh, warrant further uh, investigation. Thank you, doctor, for that. Uh, last call for any questions from our moderators or comments. All right, Dr. Lin, Dr. Kassam, thank you very, very much for bringing this uh, forward to us and uh, remind everyone again, there's a whole section on this drug in our upcoming report for more information. And uh, thank you again, doctors. Thank you, thank you for having us. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to our last panel. And uh, we're glad to uh, have a discussion on the topic of patients patient assistance programs and copay accumulators. So we chose this topic because it's subject of two, it was the subject of two proposed bills during the 2021 legislative session. This was the first topic, just a reminder that the department does not have a position on these programs. We do recognize the importance of this topic for policymakers and the public. I know the presenters will go into this in more detail, but for those of you who don't know, patient assistance programs are usually sponsored by a drug manufacturer to help consumers pay for out-of-pocket costs not covered by an insurance plan. Copay accumulators are a feature of an insurance policy where these payments do not count towards the patient's deductible and out-of-pocket maximum. So the panelists will talk today about how these two things can affect prescription drug prices. So we'll turn it over uh, to the first of our presenters, Professor Feldman. Uh, we'll have three presenters, uh, about five minutes or so each, and then we'll have questions from the moderators. So Professor Feldman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to share some thoughts on patient assistance programs and copay accumulators. The first thing I would like to say, quite simply, is that sometimes a gift is a Trojan horse. It seems as if a, it's a wonderful offering, even a, a blessing, um, but you have to be aware of what lies hidden within. That's the case with patient assistance programs. For patients who are struggling to pay for tremendously expensive medication, providing a coupon seems heaven sent, and it's even more so if it's a life-saving drug. But the cost to the patient, not to mention the healthcare system, are carefully camouflaged. So with a coupon or other form of patient assistant program, the brand name company agrees to pay all or a significant portion of the patient's out-of-pocket costs. Thus the patient sees tremendous relief in the form of out-of-pocket costs, but it's an illusion. The health insurance plan is forced to pay for the more expensive brand name drug rather than the generic. The amount that the plan has to pay for the drug is then reflected in the cost of the annual premium that patients play, pay, which means that premiums can rise for everyone in the plan, including the specific patient. Thus, the patient who paid less at the pharmacy counter may well be paying higher annual premiums as a result. And those are very real costs that the patient has to pay, but
but they're hidden in the belly of the beast. Now, in the process of handing out patient assistance, companies can purchase brand loyalty. And specifically, studies show that patient assistance programs increase brand name drug sales by 60%. They do this mostly by reducing sales to generic competitors, which increases drug costs for all patients in prescription drug brands. In 2020, a US House Oversight Committee report provided an inside view of how pharma companies themselves think about patient assistance programs. The report examined reams of documents from Novartis relating to its blockbuster oncology drug, Gleevec. As the congressional report explained, the company's documents showed that copay assistant programs were a crucial piece of its strategy to encourage patients to stay with the brand name drug after generics entered. The company even calculated that beefing up the strategy six months before generics entered the market would be the timing that provided the greatest return on investment by keeping the maximum number of patients attached to the drug before the generics made it to market and therefore after. And the return on the company's investment was impressive. The company documents showed that the patient assistance program on the drug provided a return on investment of $8.90 for every dollar spent on the program. Now, when a company is making nine additional dollars for every dollar it hands out with a coupon, the company's not acting out of the goodness of its heart, and one would not expect it to be. Pharmaceutical companies are, after all, profit-making entities. Now, given these hidden costs, health plans have pushed back, creating policies that stop such programs from counting towards a patient's deductible or out-of-pocket maximum. So for example, if a patient brings in a coupon in which the pharma company pays for the out-of-pocket costs, the insurance plan does not count the dollar amount of the coupon towards the patient's out-of-pocket maximum, which makes sense. After all, the patient didn't pay that amount out of pocket, the pharma company did. These health plan limitations are known as copay accumulators or copay maximizers, depending on how they're organized. Of course, the patient is now wedded to an expensive brand name drug rather than the generic version and may be reluctant to change. So when the maximum value of the company's coupon is reached, the patient is then socked with the extremely high out-of-pocket cost of the brand name drug. That is yet again, another hidden price that patients have to pay. If they took the generic, the out-of-pocket cost would be much lower. I began today with a reference to the Trojan horse. I will end with one as well by offering a revised version of a well-known saying, one should beware of those bearing gifts. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor, very much. Yeah, please hold on. We're going to uh, move to questions after we've heard from everyone. We're glad to move to next Daria McGrew, Director of State Policy for Pharma. Daria, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Commissioner and members. Thanks for inviting us today. My name is Daria McGrew, uh, Director of State Policy, as, the, <laughs> as was stated, for Pharma. Pharma is a trade association of 33 member companies that research, develop, and manufacture innovative brand drugs and cures. Next slide, please. This is another version of a slide that was shown earlier in this hearing discussing supply chain. I think most of us in the last two years have learned far more about supply chains than, than we thought we should, whether it's uh, toilet paper, groceries, consumer electronics, and yes, medicines. Uh, we, we now more, know more than we did before. And it is highlighted for us that these are nonlinear and that there are more players than uh, most people might think there are. Um, these middlemen are involved in the system and the intent of this program is to better understand drivers in cost. And we believe that you can't really understand the drivers and the cost when only taking a snapshot of one or two players. And in fact, your 2020 report um, of this program suggested that the legislature should 
take a look at transparency on the middlemen in this system as well. And I hope that that is reflected again in this year's report. Next slide, please. Um, as was mentioned, I think this also mirrors an earlier slide, uh, increases in drug costs are, are slowing. The, the, the growth is slowing. And in the last few years, um, that growth has come down to about equal with inflation. And that is for the wholesale acquisition cost or the, the list price of the drug. When you look at net price growth, that's after you take into account negotiated savings and rebates, the net price paid by plans and PBMs has slowed, the growth has slowed to in fact negative or, um, or restriction. This graph stops at 2020, but in my next slide, please, um, I've sh just shown an update of 2021 numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics as of September. You can see prescription drug growth still in the negative, far more than most other sectors, all other sectors on this graph, and in fact, much, um, much smaller than our current rate of inflation. Next slide, please. Now there's another way to look at growth that has been um, dis at cost that's discussed here, and that's the net prescription spend. On the left, uh, when you take into account not just the cost of the drug, but how much of each drug is used by or, or dispensed, um, you get to the net spend by a payer or the plan. And that has also slowed down drastically. In the last five years, you can see um, growth in, the, in net spend is way down. So if costs are down and net spend is down, why are your constituents and your neighbors still saying that they're paying more out of pocket? They are getting squeezed at the pharmacy counter. And we know that's true. One of the reasons um, is complexity in this system, multiple players getting, getting their dollar in. Next slide, please. But another reason is uh, over the last decade, there have been major changes in plan design. You may have heard people say insurance doesn't act like insurance used to act. Um, so patients are far more likely to be in a high deductible health plan or a co-insurance situation. And in both of those, the, uh, the plan is passing on uh, supposedly some of the cost of the drug directly to the patient, either through a percentage of, of the cost or in a high deductible period. Uh, at the beginning of the year. However, what we've seen is that in, in many of those instances, the patient is being charged a percentage or full list price, even though uh, the insurance and the PBM is not paying that list price. They are getting a negotiated, heavily negotiated price and not, not sharing that with patients. Next slide, please. Um, that shared savings that that uh, pharmaceutical companies reduced the price in 2020 to plans and PBMs by $187 billion. And we would submit that that cost should be shared with consumers. Legislation would be needed to require them um, to, to do what's fair, which is uh, not charge patients for prices they didn't pay. And this could save patients. A new study showed um, $900 on average per year, obviously a significant savings at the pharmacy counter. Um, and the same study found that it would not increase premiums uh, significantly, it would be less than 1% savings. Um, now, as was mentioned uh, by Professor Feldman, there are some perverse system, perverse um, incentives in the system and pharma agrees that this system is broken and needs change, such as this legislation we've suggested here. Next slide, please. Um, but in the meantime, uh, we do believe that patient assistance programs are uh, helpful for patients who are paying out of pocket due to plan design. Um, in 2018, uh, manufacturers, uh, one of many different types of patient assistance programs that lower costs, but uh, manufacturers supported consumers with pharmacy counter out of pocket costs by $13 billion. Um, and I know that my time is up. So I next slide, I would like to stop here um, and wait for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And we'll uh, take questions in a minute after our last panelist will now introduce Robert Judge, Director of Pharmacy Services for Moda Health Plan. Uh, Robert, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Um, and good afternoon. My name is Robert Judge and I'm the Director of Pharmacy Services uh, at Moda Health. Moda Health is a Pacific 
Oop, am I showing? No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, uh, Motor Health is a is a Pacific Northwest based uh, insurer providing medical, pharmacy, and dental uh, services for commercial, Medicaid, Medicare exchange um, plans throughout Alaska, Washington, and of course here in Oregon. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to appear before um, the prescription drug transparency uh, hearing and to give our thoughts on my thoughts on the um, use of copay programs. Go to the next slide, please. So, the, you know, I'm gonna spend a few minutes kind of setting the table here um, and give a payer's perspective on the use of, uh, and the value of copay coupons and the impact they have on payers management programs as we seek to deliver ourselves, our mission on high quality drug benefits that help keep costs low for groups and members that are covered under uh, kind of a, a payer's uh, plans. Uh, from our perspective, there's really two key functions that are essential in managing a pharmacy benefit to um, keep sustainable uh, drug costs for employers and other payers. And that's you know, effective formulary management and um, programs, uh, clinical utilization management program and activities that help uh, ensure the right drug gets the right patient at the right time for the right price. Um, these programs have a really long and successful record of ensuring broad access uh, to effective and affordable medication use. Uh, but the rapid expansion of copay, uh, copay, copay programs uh, in the marketplace by manufacturers really places a pretty tremendous strain on um, those fundamental tools and, and are subsequently impacting our ability to maintain really high value drug benefits for, for members. So while uh, Professor Feldman said, while, while appearing to be charitable efforts, uh, that help patients pay for expensive medications, you know, their wide use of copay programs actually circumvent our evidence-based and cost-effective benefit designs and, uh, you know, result in increased costs for payers and members. Uh, you know, to be fair, manufacturer assistance programs can play a valuable role, uh, especially for individuals who can benefit from the availability of manufacturer means-tested subsidy programs for those who are unable to pay for their medications. However, their application without coordination with payers results in conflicts in the marketplace and causes a lot of confusion for members by making them insensitive to cost and undermining the efforts uh, that encourage the use of more cost-effective and clinically appropriate uh, drug alternatives. Go to the next slide, please. So, you know, to, to be sure, you know, and, and, and as we just saw by the prior uh, presentation, you know, manufacturers and, and payers they have different perspectives on how to ensure that correct therapies are available to individuals in the marketplace. You know, as mentioned on my prior slide, you know, payers approach medication selection through a, a pretty rigorous uh, clinical set of activities that identify the best therapies for specific conditions. Um, these investigations are typically conducted through our independent pharmacy and therapy committees who assess the evidence and then make recommendations whether a drug must be added, um, must not be added, or may be included on a formulary. Um, and those drugs designated as a may be included are typically the ones that we go back to manufacturers for better price uh, concessions so, uh, so we can get them placed on formulary. However, once the formula is established with the lower cost um, effective therapies prioritized, we use clinical tools to really ensure the medication that's dispensed is the right drug at the right price at the right time. Um, this set of practices has enabled you know, really broad access to medications uh, at the most affordable prices for payers and beneficiaries. That's our perspective from the payer perspective. Generally speaking, for manufacturers, copay programs are used really to accomplish their objective, which is to get their branded product broadly used in the marketplace. So, at their core, copay coupons are, are really marketing tools that are used just like any other coupon program used in any other industry in the marketplace to promote purchases. Drug manufacturers use these programs to steer insured patients to their medication. Broad use of a copay coupon circumvents plan sponsors formulary strategies uh, since their presence of a copay card means the member may not have a financial incentive at all to use a lower cost preferred therapy. 
So copay coupons have been, uh, as a consequence, you know, extremely effective in terms of driving new user adoption. And as referenced by Professor Feldman, you know, the, the ROI on those use of those programs is significant, four to one to six point one, you know, six to one a return on investment to manufacturers. But unfortunately, when those coupons are used uh, to drive increased sales of high-priced drugs for manufacturers, the employers and insurers must pay for them. Uh, those increased costs are passed along to members in the form of higher premiums. Um, and even the concessions that um, manufacturers provide in the form of rebates are factored into the, the rate setting that we use for uh, premiums to members. So the bene benefits extend to everybody. Um, so as a result of those programs, uh, you know, and the, the how copay coupons run because they're not lasting forever, they have start and end dates. Um, individual consumers end up paying more because they're locked into a drug that they've been on therapy for. Um, so they don't pay less in the longer term. Um, and researchers, as I think has been amply pointed out here from Harvard Kellogg School and UCLA, you know, they've calculated that consumers actually pay more in the form of $2.7 billion more for healthcare because of the use of copay coupons. If you go to the next slide. So I'm going to try to wrap really quickly. So, because I have an interesting twist on the back of this. You know, so what are the challenges that you know industry faces with the proliferation of these of these programs? While these programs, you know, really introduce new therapies to individuals and help them to save money, uh, you know, at least in the short term, you know, they have a they have a negative consequence in terms of um, they do so outside of the processes used by payers who are responsible for you know the overwhelming cost of the medications. So there's a conflict between I'm on a therapy and it's not a therapy that's been proved to be effective or placed on therapy on a formulary. So there's, there's that conflict that gets created. Uh, the issues presented by copay programs are less burdensome though, when the drug in question has been approved by the payer uh, for use with the member, since it's already been determined by the drug to be the right drug at the right time. So if it's on formulary and there's a coupon, it, it, there's a way to make that work. Um, especially if that drug has been gone through utilization management, the prior authorization requirements to make sure that that drug is the right drug for that patient and a, and a coupon can be used. However, when a copay coupon is used to jumpstart an individual on a therapy at no out-of-pocket cost to the member, regardless whether that drug is on the formula or not on the formula, um, those programs give members the illusion of a lower prescription drug cost, but they ultimately leave the individuals and payers responsible for the full cost of the drug after the coupon program, coupon program ends. Uh, and that is a cost that's borne by all the insurers. So, you know, and, and lastly, I'll say, you know, I think we need to take a lesson from what CMS is doing, you know, and how they evaluate the use of copay uh, coupons. You know, from the federal perspective, coupons can't be used. It's determined to be illegal uh, in federal programs like Medicare and Medicaid. Um, because they run up against anti-kickback statute risks. So, you know, and, you know, that the use of those coupon, coupon programs really has been under scrutiny by Health and Human Services, the Office of the Inspector General, you know, um, because they view that that is a steerage to a drug company's product um, instead of a less expensive, appropriate alternative that can be more cost effective. So I want to end this by, by really saying that you know, I think there's a middle ground here. Uh, when a coupon can help an individual reduce the overall cost of medications used by an individual in the health plan, it's a good thing. And to make that work, it has to be used in concert and in coordination with copay accumulators or copay maximizers, as re referenced earlier. Then you have some synergy to actually lower the overall cost to everybody. Individuals who are using the drug and the cost of the drug to manufacturers. Uh, that's where we need to figure out how to work together. So I'll just leave it right there. Thank you, Robert. And thank you again to the other panelists. Let's move on to questions from our moderators. I see Representative Prusak, you have your hand up, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you to the panel. Um, you know, as chair of healthcare, 
the copay accumulator bill came through um, my committee and had a lot of discussions around this with committee members. And I did come to the conclusion, um, as many did, of everything that was presented by Robin and also um, by Robert. And I saw in the chat that someone was disappointed that consumers or advocacy organizations were not invited to speak. So I will just briefly touch on um, to look in the chat on that. And I think that nobody disagrees with wanting to ensure those with really expensive medications get help and get a coupon. And one of the things that Robert said was this coupons used just like in, in everything else, but medicine isn't like everything else. Medicine can either save your life or potentially lose your life, which is what the uh, consumers of the advocacy organizations would stress. And so I will do that for you. But um, my question is for um, Daria, and that is you mentioned in your presentation that you think that there should be more transparency with the middleman or our uh, PBMs, our um, uh, pharmacy benefit managers. And I agree with you. But what we really needed for this policy to pass was transparency in copay accumulator programs. How do they contribute to the increased cost of insurance, like Robert mentioned, or everything else that Robin mentioned? So with that being said, since you support, um, we think, uh, transparency on PBMs, I'm wondering how you feel about transparency for copay accumulators. Thank you. Thanks, Representative Prusak. Um, and Unfortunately, we we don't have a position. Um, as you know, we didn't take a position on your bill. Copay accumulators are um, an issue that the patient groups uh, joined us to speak about. I would I would again refer you to um, the gentleman from the Hemophilia Association and the other comments in the chat that um, the copay accumulator programs are really um, really critical for a subset of patients, and and they are the ones that have. The strongest um, opinions and um, comments about it. Thank you. And I just want to clarify that it wasn't my bill, it came to the committee, and that I think this is where we need to do some work. I think that we need to take positions on things that will help us understand the cost to the system as we use all of these pieces. Thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. I uh, see Senator Patterson, you have your hand up. Thank you, Commissioner Stolfi. Um, I have a question for Dr. Uh, Professor Feldman, and that's uh, a follow-up question to Representative Prusak's question and um, uh, Ms. McGrew, uh, Dr. McGrew's uh, response related to the patient, a uh, disease-specific patient advocacy organization. She had mentioned the hemophilia um, organization that we had a speaker or a, a, a participant um, from earlier. My question to Dr. Feldman is this, uh, Dr. Feldman, what is the relationship between dis, uh, many of the disease-specific patient advocacy organizations and um, the pharmaceutical industry and use of things such as a promotion of uh, things like the copay accumulators and the coupons. Thank you. Now, it's very difficult to know exactly what's going on in the patient advocacy organizations, but some careful research has shown that the majority of funding for these um, organizations come from the pharmaceutical industry itself. Um, there have been proposals, and, and I have written advocating this, that there should be sunshine for all of those gifts. So, so people understand where the impetus is coming from and, and where the, the funding is coming from. So you can find an amazing um, triangle of pressure. It comes from the pharmaceutical companies, which um, pays for the patient advocacy groups. You have very desperate patients who are are doing their best to pay for the drugs that they need, also being offered these wonderfully appealing gifts at the side, and then are willing to talk about how important that is. Um, 
all of this I, I consider problematic from a sunshine transparency perspective and also from the perspective of what patients should understand about what the costs are of all of these things. Finally, I would add that these organizations have amazing tax benefits. In fact, the types of organizations we've been talking about, the patient assistance, it's other organizations, they, from pharmaceutical companies, these constitute 10 out of the 15 largest charitable organizations. Why? Because they qualify for an enhanced form of tax deduction. So the, the pharmaceutical companies really are doing well from these, but there's a question of whether they're actually doing good. Thank you so much, Professor Feldman. And, and uh, Commissioner Stolfi, if I could just make one additional comment. Um, I did take a look at some of the 990s of a couple of patient advocacy organizations and saw what you said, nonprofit. Um, the, you saw the salaries of the um, executives uh, there and no indication of where funding was coming from um, in any transparent manner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. So we've got time for one more question. Trilby, I see you have your hand up. Please go right ahead. Okay, yes, and I'll try to keep this simple in the interest of time. It sounds like, you know, a lot of the complaints with the co-pays or the coupons is that they create confusion, they obfuscate costs, and they can create cliffs for consumers. And we can't see where the real costs are ending up. Um, the question is for Daria, really, about isn't it true that the rebates are creating that same kind of confusion and, and, and you're pointing out that they don't get passed on when they should be passed on. Why not end the rebates at this point? Why not just start the prices lower? Hi, uh, thank you for your question. Um, I would agree the rebate system is a broken system. Uh, unfortunately, the system that we have now uh, incentivizes plans to choose uh, and, and prioritize drugs based on deep discounts and not uh, choose drugs for placement that actually have a lower introduction price. Which would be a better place for us to end up is, is I think what, where I'd like to leave that. Well, thank you, Trilby. Um, see if uh, there are any last questions from any of our moderators. All right, not seeing any. Professor Feldman, Daria, Robert, thank you very much for joining us. Very much appreciate your participation. And uh, let's then move on to our final topic, our second public comment period. We do have two individuals who've signed up. Uh, if anyone else would like to speak, please request that now in the chat. And we're going to start with Mary Beth Guano, healthcare advocate at Osberg. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, like you said, my name is Mary Beth Garino. I'm the healthcare advocate from Osberg. And we are a uh, consumer advocacy organization with members throughout the state. And we're very excited to see this program uh, provide a better picture of Oregon prescription drug prices every single year. Um, transparency is really important, and the information that comes from reports like this one provides a better understanding of what's actually happening. Um, like Numi said earlier, it's not surprising that in years two and three of this report, there's been a significant decrease in reported price increases for brand name drugs. Um, I estimated, it's, I think it's like an 80% decrease for the first year of the program, which is incredible. So, um, but even with this increased transparency and a reduction in those reported price increases, prescription drugs still cost too much. Um, at Ozperg, we work on a variety of healthcare issues, but the number one healthcare topic our members ask me about is lowering prescription drug costs. We've heard from consumers with diseases like MS who pay thousands of dollars every month for their medication. And even our members with low prescription drug costs attribute that to their insurance and still worry about the cost to them if they lose their job or lose their coverage. Um, one woman who told us her story, Kathy Blair, has chronic migraines. And if any of you have ever experienced a migraine, I don't have to tell you how painful they can be. Um, Kathy was prescribed a medication to help with her condition, but it's $200 a month. And with her current budget, it's not something she can afford every month. And so as a result, she lives with chronic pain and constant worry about the cost of her prescription. And unfortunately, Kathy isn't alone. Um, in an Altarum survey from June of this year, about a fourth of Oregonians reported not filling a prescription, cutting pills in half, 
or skipping a dose due to the cost. Um, so whether a drug is $200 or $2,000, prescription drug affordability is a real issue that Oregonians need addressed. That's why we're really happy to support the efforts of the transparency program as it continues to monitor pharmaceutical costs and look for ways to increase the information available about the industry. Um, as mentioned earlier in the last legislative session, there was a bill uh, that would have expanded the program to include reporting information on patient assistance programs, which would have helped inform the broader drug price transparency program and provide data on affordability challenges and the aid that people need in order to actually use their prescriptions. And we were disappointed to see the legislature stall in passing that in 2021, but we hope to see the, the program's recommendations to improve tra price transparency return in future sessions. Um, and there are other few, excuse me, there are a few other ways we'd like to see the program improve as well. Um, the first is in determining reasons for non-compliance with the program, as at least in last year's report, there was only an estimated 70 to 85% compliance rate with reporting. Um, and though enforcement was able to improve that rate through outreach and education, we'd like to see less need for that follow-up, especially in cases of repeated failures to report. Um, and then the other things we'd like to see as the pr program is becoming more routine is even more consistency in the metrics that are released um, to provide more trackable data from year to year and holding these hearings after the report is publicly available so that consumers, advocates, and others can provide more specific comments during the hearing. Um, so in short, we need to do more to lower prescription drug costs to help Oregonians like Kathy. And to that point, we're excited to see the newly established Prescription Drug Affordability Board use the information provided by this program to find ways to actually lower costs um, and hope that the work DCBS continues to, to do will lead to more accountability and lower costs for Oregonians when it comes to prescription drugs. Thank you so much for your hard work and we look forward to supporting those efforts in this program. Thank you, Mary Beth. Great information and, and very good recommendations for us as well about how we can improve these hearings. So thank you for that. So we have one more individual who signed up to give public testimony. That's uh, Joan Morgan from OCAP. Hi, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Joan Morgan and um, I am a patient advocate with OCAP. I also work in healthcare and I've been taking care of my parents for the past seven years. Um, and I've been telling my story about my family for, for what feels like forever now. It's been about four years trying to just shine a light on the exorbitant drug prices. And I can spout facts, diagnoses, costs in my sleep at this point. But at the end of the day, it's a numbers game. So I just want to share some of the numbers that my family has been facing. Um, my dad has this rare gene mutation. And so when he was diagnosed with advanced late stage lung cancer, they told us that it's only seen in about 1% of the population and traditional therapies simply weren't gonna cut it for him. And they said to get his affairs in order because he had about six to 18 months um, until it was his time. And as devastating as that was, we started to get things together. And then his oncologist called and said, hey, the FDA just approved this new treatment. We really think that this could help things. And you know, let's give it a shot. We don't have anything else. We said, great, we have hope, fantastic. But that hope came with a price tag of $4,000 a month. There's just no way that we could afford that. And uh, thankfully we were able to kind of cobble together money. We moved my dad in with us. We liquidated assets. We did everything that we could. We tried to get him on Medicaid. I mean, if there was a way we looked into it. Um, and eventually we were able to get some assistance from the drug company, which we had talked about here earlier today. Uh, and we were thankful for that. But then the next year, his application was denied due to a clerical error, and there was no funds left for him. So we were faced with $4,000 a month again, or so we thought. Um, in that year, it had actually risen to $10,000 per month. The medication had not changed. Um, we didn't know what to do. Uh, thankfully for my family, my sister lives in the Netherlands. And so she began traveling to the U.S. to visit us twice a year and bringing his medication. Because while it's $10,000 a month here, it's $243 a month in Holland. Just think about that for a quick second. Do the math because it, it, it blows my mind even after we've been doing this for years. You know, and, and I think that the drug companies know that we're willing to do anything that we can. In this time period, we've been given four years. And that was time that was absolutely not promised. We recently lost my mother. And they know that these families are, I can't imagine, like I'm, I'm gonna have a hard time talking about this, but 
what are we supposed to do? I can't fathom losing my dad at this point. I'll be 35 and not have a parent left. And it's simply because we can't afford medications. So I know that we can do better and I really hope that Oregon can lead the way in this. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Joan, for joining us and for sharing that very much. So I don't believe we have any more folks signed up to give public testimony. So uh, at this time, I'll, I'll see if any of our moderators, any of the legislators and Trilby have any closing thoughts or questions before I close out. Um, no real closing thoughts or comments other than to say thank you to the department and of course our presenters today for the information and the things that they shared and um, I continue to be um, delighted uh, in the way that the agency is implementing my bill. I will also uh give my thanks to DCBS and to um, everyone that showed up on the panels and um, to public testimony. Thank you to the last um, person to share your personal story. And I think that every legislator here is committed to figuring out how we can decrease costs and improve access. This is a bipartisan issue. This is an issue that impacts everyone and we have to come up with solutions. So thank you all um, and hope we can all share this event today out um, to the wider community. All right, I would just add real quick that, um, you know, really the same thing. Thank you uh, DCBS for putting this on uh, to everybody you presented. Uh, but especially to those who took part in the uh, public testimony, um, it's, it's that that is invaluable um, as we uh, move forward and continue to uh, provide a, a system that's affordable and accessible. So thank you. And I'd just like to add a word of thanks to all as well. And thank you for starting out with the stories and ending with stories, because that's where really that's what this is all about, is helping the people of Oregon. So I'm so grateful to all of you for, the, for this presentation and for the work that you're all doing. And finally, Andrew, from, from the perspective. perspective of OHA and my malfunctioning buttons today, um, just really appreciate all the work here at DCBS um, to bring some transparency and, and all the information that was shared today with, was really valuable learning. Um, and I look forward to bringing some of these points back to folks at OHA who are working on the healthcare, care, healthcare cost growth target program. I know that some of the data that we are going to be receiving in the aggregate will be post rebate prices for perhaps the first time in um, a very, very long time. We'll have a chance to look at that. And um, I think shining the light here is so critically important. And special thanks to consumers who've shared things with us today, especially the last speaker. It's such a powerful note to end on in it. I think it energizes all of us. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Trilby. Thank you so much to every one of our moderators, to all the panelists, and especially to the members of the public who joined and shared their perspectives and their stories. Uh, with that, I want to thank everyone for attending our 2021 public hearing on drug price transparency. Uh, we welcome your comments still at any time. You can see the address there on the screen. So please send in any comments you have about this hearing about drug price increases uh, to rx.prices at dcbs.oregon.gov. Uh, we will have our report finalized and filed with the legislature as mentioned by December 15th, and it will be available on our website. We've put into the chat uh, a web address where you can go and get that information. So with that, thank you again to everyone so much for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again next year, and we'll adjourn this meeting.